Good morning, class. This is the first of a series of video lectures uh, and keynotes that I put online for uh, the History 201 online course. I started doing this during the quarantine, which actually I'm still in the midst of, uh, and decided that I liked the, uh, the course itself better than the course that was being offered uh, by uh, uh, through the through the university, uh, using uh, a bunch of canned lectures uh, that we already had uh, available. So, what I'm going to do is, uh, for each lecture, I will have a uh, keynote, which is the Mac equivalent of a PowerPoint. I'm not a big fan of PowerPoint, <clears throat> and I'll also have um, uh, oh, and they're they're going to be available on YouTube. Uh, I'll also have online notes that cover the lecture material, and so that will be the material that you will use for the online course. The keynotes with voice uh, uh, voiceover, as well as the online lectures. So all this is in, in the syllabus. You'll be able to look it up and see what you need to do uh, in order to take the exams. There are no turn-in assignments in the course. Uh, everything is based on reading the notes, watching the videos, and uh, taking exams. There will be four exams in the course, and as I said, all this stuff is in your um, is is in your uh, syllabus. So so let's get started on the first lecture today. It's called Columbus and Other Lost Europeans. And, and it's a sort of a brief discussion of the aims and goals of the original explorers, the original uh, Europeans who came to, to try to found, well, actually Asia, to try to find Asia uh, and ran into a huge and inconvenient chunk of real estate called the Western Hemisphere, the Americas. On September 25th, 1492, absolutely nothing of any consequence happened. One of Columbus's crew members sighted land, uh, but this was a kind of a frequent occurrence uh, on the voyage because the captain had offered a reward to the first person who spotted land. Th by this time, uh, the coast of North America was still about a thousand miles away. On October 12th, land was actually sighted, and Columbus, in an enormously symbolic move that would would say an awful lot about future European exploration, uh, immediately fired a cannon at it. He was very lucky to be there at all. Uh, had he sailed earlier or later in the year, uh, he, might, he might not have made it there or back. Uh, the crew was following flocks of migratory birds to land Two weeks earlier, those same birds would have led him to the treacherous shoals, shoals sorry, of Florida, uh, where he probably would have run aground on a rocky coastline. Uh, two weeks afterwards, they probably would have sent him in the direction of central Mexico. Uh, he would have missed most of the islands in the Caribbean, and it would have added almost another six months to his voyage it's very possible he would have turned around uh, and gone home before he actually made landfall. So Columbus actually shares a great deal of experience and a great deal of, of ideas uh, with other explorers for several generations. They were generally led by lost explorers uh, who were searching for stuff that wasn't there, uh, and looking for uh, a passage to Asia that didn't exist. What America actually was to Europeans was a large, very inconvenient lump of geography between them and where they wanted to be, Asia. So for almost 250 years, Europeans searched for a water route through America to the Pacific Ocean. They kept finding it too, 
The only problem was it doesn't exist. The Italian cartographer and explorer Giovanni de Veranzano decided that America was only one mile wide and he had seen Pimlico Sound across the narrow natural causeway and decided that the sound itself must be the Pacific Ocean and whatever he saw on the other side of that was Asia. Well, it wasn't. In 1528, Panfilo de Narvez, a vain, arrogant, one-eyed Spanish soldier of fortune, mercenary, got a license from the King of Spain to explore, for which read uh, loot, the area north of Mexico. The king sent his own treasurer to make sure that the Spanish crown got its share of the goodies, uh, an imperial civil servant and bean counter by the name of Cabeza de Vaca, the party landed with 400 soldiers just north of what Narvez thought was Tampico, Mexico, uh, and Narvez unloaded his expedition and sent the ships home, or at least back to Cuba. The only problem was that Narvez had made a slight miscalculation. They had actually landed near modern Tampa, Florida. Uh, eight years later, the five survivors of the expedition stumbled into a mission in western Mexico. In 1607, the English captain, John Smith, explored the various rivers of Virginia uh, looking for a route to China, well, which wasn't there. French, Dutch, and English explorers confidently expected that the Long Island Sound, the East River, or the St. Lawrence Seaway would provide them with a short, safe water route to Asia. Eh, wrong. Now, native peoples were only too willing to help. They quickly discovered that the best way to get rid of these uncouth and usually dangerous and odd-smelling strangers was to tell them that what they wanted was somewhere else. Henry Hudson heard Indians talking about a great ocean three days west. It was the Great Lakes, not the Pacific. In 1548, the French explorer Jacques Cartier, my lecture note online actually says Henri Cartier, uh, who was a jeweler, uh, Jacques Cartier heard the same story and founded Lake Erie. In 1596, Greek explorer Juan de la Fuca managed to convince European cartographers that he had discovered a water route from the Pacific, from the Pacific Ocean end across the American North, to the American Northeast. He hadn't, but map makers put his route in anyway for years and years. One thing that Lewis and Clark were looking for in the early 1800s, after the U.S. bought the Louisiana Purchase, was a water route from the eastern United States to the Pacific Ocean. It still wasn't there. Now, since this course is devoted to the history of the United States, uh, from here on out, with a couple of exceptions, I will primarily restrict our focus to North America. So, let's now leave behind the perceptions of North America and take a look at the realities. Let's start with the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean flows between Europe and, and, the, uh, and the Americas. Uh, it had three roles to play in European exploration, expansion, and colonization. It is a barrier, a road, and also a resource. So let's start with the 
Atlantic Ocean as a barrier. There are two basic routes to the Western Hemisphere from Europe, the Northern Route and the Southern Route. The Spanish took the Southern Route, which began in Spain and ended in the Caribbean and Mexico. So the English took the Northern Route. The trip either way took up to three months, but the Southern Route, although longer, was less perilous. The most dangerous leg of the trip was the last three miles. Shifting sandbags, hidden rocks, reefs, all offered opportunities for European seamen to lose their ships and their lives literally within sight of land and safety. Now the best way to find these hazards was to risk them. Ships traveled in flotillas, so if one ship went down, the survivors tried to land somewhere else and marked the dangers down on their charts. Usually the same dangers were discovered three or four times by ships of different nationalities because countries didn't tell other countries about their explorations, their secrets, or their maps. This allowed everyone to make the same mistakes over and over and over. Now, the Atlantic Ocean as a barrier is important in another way, too. To some degree, barriers offer isolation from the mother country. So American colonies tended to develop local self-government, more independence and autonomy from the mother country than colonies nearer to home. Compare the British colonies in North America with the other British colony at the time, Ireland, which was governed much more closely from London than any American colony ever would be. But the colonies were still dependent on England because England's enemies, the Dutch, the French, and the Spanish, surrounded them on land and at sea and colonists depended on the British armed forces, especially the Navy, to protect their lives and property. Now, another way that the Atlantic Ocean is a barrier is that it made the transportation of people to North America very expensive. Uh, so there would be a labor shortage and a land surplus in North America from the very beginning of colonization almost down to the beginning of the 19th century. That meant that if you could get to America, your opportunities would be vastly greater than ever could have been in Europe. Free white laborers would not be very likely to work for anyone after they had been paid off uh, or after they'd paid off their debts. Uh, once they were independent financially, uh, they would be able to move west, find land, and become planters or farmers themselves. For free whites, opportunities for wealth abounded in ways that were no longer possible in Europe. So we've talked about the Atlantic Ocean as a barrier. Now let's talk about it as a road. The cost to transport one ton of material from Massachusetts to London was the same as the cost to move the same weight of goods overland about 30 miles. Now think about that. One ton of material by sea to London from Massachusetts, that cost wouldn't get you from Massachusetts to Philadelphia. So each colony was a seaboard colony, and each colony had a cheap means of exporting goods for a world market. This alternately retarded colonial unity. Virtually all trade was directly with the mother country. There was a fairly brisk coastal trade up and down the American seaboard, but the bulk of colonial trade was with Britain. The colonies never cooperated on anything. They never believed they had much of anything in common, 
until the American Revolution. In fact, to a lesser or greater degree, folks from the various colonies really didn't even like each other. So now let's look at the Atlantic Ocean as a resource. The Atlantic was exploitable. Fish was the first commodity that was profitable for English colonists in America. So, uh, cod was caught off the shores of New England and Nova Scotia, salted and shipped by the ton to Europe to feed Catholics. The English hated fish just as much as they hated Catholics. The ocean kept settlers alive when they first arrived. Many of them write home in disgust, saying the only thing that they could eat were oysters and mussels, crabs, and codfish. Now let's talk a bit about the geography of the eastern coast or the eastern lands of North America. Uh, the first, moving from the Atlantic Ocean to the shores of the eastern coast of North America, uh, the first geographical uh, object that you encounter is a lopsided triangle uh, that goes from Cape Cod in the north all the way down into Alabama in the south. And this is called the coastal plain. The shape of this great alluvial coastal plain helps to shape the uh, economics of the English colonies in North America. The northeastern seacoast only offers a very small amount of good farmland. In, Nor in New England, the colonists had to turn to other sources of economic activity. New Englanders were involved in shipping, trade, shipbuilding, fishing, and other seagoing activities. Farms were small, family concerns rather than great plantations. The relatively long winters and cold weather further restricted farming activities to the production of necessities rather than to exportable cash crops. The further south that you travel, the better the farmland, and the more of it there is. So the Northeast grew wealthy on trade, the South grew wealthy on agriculture. In the South, there were also many short navigable rivers uh, that go from west to east that start in the Appalachian Mountains and flow down to the uh, Atlantic coast. So plantations could have their own docks. The South developed only one city of any real size during the entire colonial period. That was Charleston, South Carolina. As you move further west, you run into mountains. The great Appalachian mountain lands or mountain uh, mountains that run from Newfoundland in Canada all the way down to around Birmingham in Alabama. This great eastern mountain chain channeled settlement patterns in all of the colonies. The main ports of entry for immigrants was Philadelphia and Boston and New York. And in the 18th and, or 17th and early 18th century, the coastal plain rapidly filled up, especially in the north around those ports of entry. New arrivals were forced west to find more available land, and they could either fight their way across the mountains or turn, turn south in, and settle in the numerous valleys that ran north to south. Eventually, these later arrivals move all the way and settle all the way from western Pennsylvania down into Georgia, settling in scattered mountain valley communities. So every southern colony by the 1750s has two distinct cultures, based on two different streams of settlement. The earliest settlers are a cult, become a culture of the plains, and the later settlers become a culture of the valley that's often called the backcountry. In the south, 
the great planters will settle on the coastal plains of, of, the, of the southern area of North America. Uh, the earliest settlers live in rich farmlands on the eastern uh, coastal plain. They were Anglican in their religion and ethnically English. Families in these, uh, of these early settlers became planter aristocrats, wealthy and politically powerful. The Westerners of the back country arrived later and moved further west to settle in the valleys of the Appalachian mountain chain. They were Presbyterians or Methodists or Baptists in their religion and often Scots or Scotch-Irish or Welsh in their ethnicity. Lacking the resources of the great alluvial plains, these late arrivals were primarily poor small farmers, politically weaker than the great planters, Backcountry folks rapidly became a culture apart and distinct from that of their neighbors on the coast. And the backcountry culture ran across and through most of the colonies on the, in the West uh, from Pennsylvania to South Carolina.